Hi there, uh, today we're going to be lo looking at evaluating the usefulness of sociological research methods and um, we're going to just focus on practical issues. Um, I've already done a lecture previously on ethical issues and validity and there's just a quick reminder there for you. Um, ethical issues is to make sure that no harm comes to the participants, they're not deceived or lied to, which can obviously cause them harm psychologically, um, so you should be able to refer to your notes on that. Um, and we've already looked at validity uh, and examining the usefulness of a method based on their validity. So validity is very much the idea that research, does the research method under the, uncover the truth of what's going on? Or does the method make it easier for participants to be dishonest? Um, or does the method actually uh, make it quite difficult for the, re for the participants to hide what they really think or feel? That's much more likely to apply to covert methods. So. There are six main practical issues to consider. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is time. Uh, so when you're examining uh, your research methods, you want to make sure that you have enough time to conduct the research that you're planning to do. Um, so how long uh, will it take to use your particular method? Um, and actually, how much time have you got free in order to conduct that study. Uh, now, if you're obviously a professional sociologist working for a university, you might have quite a lot of time to com complete that research. However, if you need to um, maybe conduct this study in your own free time while you do another job, you might need to pick a method that perhaps is less time consuming. Uh, so in terms of quick methods, you've got things like questionnaires, you've got your structured interviews a bit quicker, and then there are also much more lengthy methods where you might have to spend time building up a relationship with participants. Um, those are things like unstructured interviews and any sort of participant observation because you've got to take part in the research with the um, uh, participants, obviously. Next practical issue to consider is cost. How expensive is your research method going to be? Uh, will you have to buy materials? Uh, will you have to pay for a space to conduct the research? Um, so materials can be things like notepads, but it could also be things like recording devices. Um, you know, you might take participants out to coffee or maybe lunch. Uh, so you might have to think about how to spend that sort of money. You might have to hire a place to have your interviews if it's in a much more of a formal interview, structured interview. Um, so those are all things to consider um, uh, is cost. Cost is obviously quite closely linked to funding. Who is actually paying for your research? Um, if you're you know, working in a university as a professional sociologist, your university will normally pay your salary. Um, so they'll pay you to do your research, but they might not be able to pay for all the expenses of your research. You need to think about that. Uh, a lot of sociologists get sponsored by the government, for example, to do sociological research. Um, sometimes companies pay for it, sometimes charities. So, for example, shelter will often uh, pay for sociological research into things like homelessness and causes of homelessness, for example. Um, so the issue with funding, just to bear in mind, because it is a practical issue, is that that can then maybe affect uh, the topics that are selected to research. Um, and you might just want to bear in mind that some research might be influenced by the funding. So you might not want to find against uh, the interests of the government, for example, because they might cut out your funding. So that's just something to bear in mind. Um, access to participants is uh, a really important practical issue to consider. So how easy is it to find the group you actually want to research? Um, if you want to do research on students in school, they're pretty easy to find. You know where they are. They're in school. Um, you know, they're in classrooms, they're in the playground, they're in the canteen. They're easy to kind of access as long as you get through the gatekeeper, which I'll talk to you about in a second. However, if you want to do research on a, you know, illegal immigrants working in, I don't know, fruit farm production, they would be quite difficult to access because they're not really supposed to, well, they're not supposed to be here. So they might be reluctant to take part in that research. Um, likewise, criminal gangs, for example, they're not going to want to say, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll complete your questionnaire because they're engaged in criminal activity. But yet yeah, they're still quite interesting to study, you know, why they might choose to make criminal choices, for example. So, um, they might be reluctant to take part in your research and you'll have to think about what research methods to use to gain access to those sort of hidden groups or those deviant groups. 
the next practical consideration is um, yourself, your your personal physical characteristics. So these are things like what well, how you look really. So your gender, your age, your ethnicity, things like facial hair can even play a part. How you look, your speech, okay, how you speak. Um, these are all your physical characteristics and they can help or hinder you gaining access to particular groups. Um, if I wanted to go and study postcode gangs in London, I'd probably struggle because I'm a bit too old to do that. Um, the way I talk, you know, I use it was called an elaborate speech code. Uh, so the gang members would immediately probably close up to me because they'd recognize me as an outsider. My ethnicity might even get in the way. Um, you know, some of these groups are Afro-Caribbean, some of them are Asian and a, a variation between the two. Um, and I'm, I'm white. I'm also middle class. So that might also restrict me in gaining access to that group. Whereas maybe a younger sociologist who perhaps come from a, an ethnic minority background who can and maybe speak um, in the sort of lexicon or the slang, if you like, of the gang members, they might be able to gain access to those sorts of groups. So how you look and actually your characteristics such as gender, age, ethnicity will really actually affect how easy it is for you to gain access to the group that you want to study. Um, it also can affect how honest people are with you. Um, so for again, maybe because of um, my age, um, a younger participant in a research might might want to impress me because I'm older than them so they might not be as honest whereas if I was talking to someone of my own age in an interview they might be more open with me because they don't have that power imbalance that we talked about in ethical issues previously so that's physical characteristics final one I want to mention to you here is gatekeepers which we've already talked about briefly when it comes to access so a gatekeeper is a person who you get, need to get permission off to gain access to your subjects. Um, in the context of schools, uh, the gatekeeper would be the head teacher. Uh, but then the head teacher might even have to get permission from the class teacher for you, for you as a researcher to gain access to that particular classroom. Um, gatekeepers can include, you know, gang leaders. They can include um, heads of organisations. Uh, so, for example, if you wanted to do some research on, I don't know, the BBC, um, you'd have to get permission from certain managers within the BBC to gain access to the offices, the studios to do your research. So, yeah, the gatekeeper can give you or deny access to the group that you want to study. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind here why a gatekeeper might be willing to allow research to happen or might, why they might be reluctant. Um, so we use the example in schools quite often. Um, say if I, you want to go and do some research and find out whether a school is racist in the way they treat um, students, um, it's going to be quite difficult to get a head teacher to go, oh yeah, come and research that in my school because that will make them look bad. Often sociological researchers have to balance up practical issues with their want and desire to be highly, highly valid and, and um, really ethical, for example. Um, and it's not always possible to do very practical research that's um, highly ethical, for example, or very valid research that's really practical. Quite often, the most valid research methods are low in practicality. Um, they take a lot of time, for example, because you build up those relationships with participants. As a result, they cost a lot of money because, you know, you've got to pay for your, your own wages. You might have to move to a location closer to your research group. You might have to spend money on going undercover, for example. And those sorts of research methods, therefore, require a high level of funding. OK, so practical research methods can sometimes be lower in validity, but they are much quicker and easier to conduct. They can be higher in reliability. They can be higher in representativeness, for example. And, you know, often they can also be quite ethical um, because practical methods such as, you know, questionnaires, they're very easy to get informed consent for. People can withdraw at any point. Um, and they can decide not to answer questions that make them feel uncomfortable so they don't feel um, any suffer any harm. So it makes them quite ethical. Thanks for listening. Bye.